let's get this started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with introducing our wonderful panelists. And I'm going to start with the people I know, of course, Dana um, from Wicked Bionics. How are you? Fantastic. Welcome. Thank you. Would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me to be here and uh, thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, so <clears throat> my name is Dana Arnett and I am CEO and co-founder of a multicultural marketing and advertising agency in Los Angeles. It's called Wicked Bionic. And, uh, you know, we, I had a, a career, a prior career in television and in, in, in entertainment for 30 years. And I always worked for other people. I had no idea that I actually, I actually could do something for myself. And uh, I left that career about nine years ago and I met a wonderful uh, business partner and we started Wicked Bionic and, and it has been, uh, being an entrepreneur is very different than working for somebody else. As I know, the co-panelists will attest, it is um, a journey like no other. And I will tell you, it is very, very rewarding because you get to create, I get to create um, anything that I want this business to be, my business partner and I, we get to do, make it anything. And what's so great is, you know, we go down, we have a plan and a business strategy, and then there's a right turn and something cooler happens and we can go there, you know, it's really, um, it's really been very fulfilling and nine years in business. Now they say, if, if you can make it past five, you're, you're, you're good. So we're, we're good. I think so. And, um, uh, say the biggest skills in this that I have learned and that I think are such a part of entrepreneurship, um, in our business is, you know, is creativity is, you know, having an analytical mind, you know, organization, um, interpersonal skills, relationships and marketing and advertising are everything, probably with every business, if you want to get clients, but, um, really um, the relationship with people and understanding who they are and them understanding who you are, because, you know, like any, in any business, it's about um, trust and building trust and building a relationship with clients, uh, team members, uh, you know, other colleagues. So Wicked Bionic has been very, very fortunate. And we are able to, um, we're able to work with government agencies and private, uh, private industry, and it's been wonderful. So thank you. Yeah, and Wicked Bionics also has hired some Fulfillment Fund alums. They've also volunteered and done a lot of in-kind support. So we thank you for all of that. Um, always on our on our back, supporting us on the back end. Um, Oscar Emegano, sorry if I'm not pronouncing no, that no correctly. Um, you are you have your own real estate company. So tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, so as she mentioned, my name is Oscar Magno. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Magno Estates. Um, basically, I'm just, I am a real estate agent with a team of two other people, but I'm also underneath another team, Revel Real Estate here. So I've been in business now for about six years and an agent about four years before that. I was in the music business, but I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. Um, Coming out of college, didn't know what I want to do really, you know, so but I knew I wanted to be my own boss. Didn't want to work for anybody else. I tried a regular, what I like to call a W-2 job. I tried that for like a week and I just quit. I was like, oh no, oh no, this is not for me. You know, because I, I like to make moves um, whenever I please, whether it's vacations or whether it's going to go see my family without asking somebody, hey, can I take a day off or looking at my, my pay time off or this, that, and other. But also with entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship is what you have to understand is that it's there's pros and cons to literally everything you know with a w2 you have that stable income that you get in every other week you know as entrepreneur you don't work you don't eat <laughs> so you have to continuously keep on working and grinding to really keep that those funds coming in and, and being able to to um, save up enough to where you can take those vacations and not necessarily have to work or do like myself and build a team. And that way you can still get paid while on vacation because your team is doing all, all the work. But, you know, besides that, it's fun for me and it's fulfilling for me as well because it gives me the liberty to do as I please and create more businesses and um, our, our opportunities for people to just really go out and, and fulfill the dream how I did. So, very cool. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to get this name next Rubidium. name right. Uh, Rubidium, or if you're a science geek, RB, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and you are um, in the film industry. So tell us a little bit more right. about what you do. 
uh, I'm a film director, I'm a screenwriter. I make movies about the sort of intersection between uh, technology and power. Um, my latest film, The Devil's Fortune, is about all the people that have died looking for uh, Saddam Hussein's lost billions. Um, so I've been a filmmaker for 20, 25 years now. Uh, I'm Australian. I was, I used to direct TV commercials there. I moved to England, I moved to Spain. Uh, 12 years ago, I came to the US and, and lived in Hollywood and worked in Hollywood for um, five, six years. Uh, I'm currently in Vermont after COVID and actually really loving living, working remotely and living in New England and the country. Uh, I have never had a job. I just don't really have the temperament for it. Um, I, with the exception of like digging, digging ditches when I was 16 for my uncle. And I think I realized then that, uh, having a, having a job is really, uh, just the, yeah, being on someone else's clock, working for someone else towards their goals and being part of their plan. Just, you know, I have utmost respect for the people that do it, but it's just not for me. I would rather, I would rather, um, you know, live you know and work and create on my own terms um and follow my own vision and i run a, a production company here in well it's actually technically a california production company uh in vermont and i have since branched out into to sort of fund um the creative pursuits and the and the uh my filmmaking i also uh run a youtube channel called the crimson engine and work a lot with brands like Canon and Sigma and uh, the filmmaking things to sort of teach filmmaking to uh, anyone who wants to learn it and the uh, you know the way that it's changing and the way that information is changing the world. Whoa. Hi. Okay. Great. So now that we've got everybody introduced and that we seem to have all of our participants, as you can see, we have a very diverse panel of entrepreneurs, real estate, filmmaking, and marketing. Um, so I just want to make a couple of announcements before we dive into the questions. Um, we're thrilled to be giving out $15,000 in scholarships tonight. Uh, two students in this chat will, will receive a scholarship of $1,000 each. So stay active. The chat will be enabled very shortly. If you have a question, you can also put it into the Q&A and we'll check them out there and we'll check out your questions in the chat as soon as that's enabled as well. So let's go ahead and jump in um, to some of our questions. And let's see, who shall we start with? Um, when when did you realize you wanted to go into your field? And I am going to direct that question over to Oscar because it sounds like you had a very different start from where you ended. <laughs> Oscar, oh. yep, mute. Happens to the best of us. All right, there we go. So um, what I will say is, in college, I studied urban planning and, and design. So by nature, I know how to, to, to plan cities essentially. So that kind of parlayed into the real estate business, but coming out of college and moving from Kansas City, Missouri, where, where I went to school at, to LA now, um, I started off in the music business actually. And I didn't know left from right. I was just kind of going where the path would lead me until um, my wife decided that I should watch the show Million Dollar List in LA. I'm sure that's, that some of you guys have watched it. So I was watching, I was like, oh my goodness, wow. These guys, they're making a quarter million dollars on one deal. I was like, what, the, like, what is going on? How can I get into this? But then I did some more research and I realized, okay, so they're agents working for investors. And I was like, ah, but I'm still working for somebody. You know, I wanna be the investor and not the agent, but I knew that I had to climb the ladder. So. I got my real estate license first. I got my, my loan officer license because I found a mentor and he had this grand scheme to where I would get my, my loan officer license and then work for his investors and do all their loans. So we did that, um, but I knew at heart, I did not want to be a lender. <laughs> That's just not me. I like math, but not that much. So um, I went and got my, my real estate license 
And it just took off from there. Me and my wife love to go to um, open houses. So we were going to open houses and I actually ran into my, my coach randomly. Well, he became my coach after like randomly meeting him. He said, look, Oscar, I know that you're a new agent. Um, if you want to uh, come to my brokerage, I will coach you, train you and everything and get you started. So million dollar listing LA to loan officer to agent. So that's kind of my trajectory and everything. And uh, eventually my goal is to become a, a developer. So just climb the ladder little by little. So, but that's kind of how I got into the business. And um, Rubidium, how about how about you? I know you didn't go from your, your uncle straight. <laughs> you can do it, uh, I oh, had always made films, um, had always made like from Super 16 little stop motion movies to, you know, the very first start of computer graphics um, and was was really interested in that and had the, ch uh, was offered the chance to go to school for film, but um, then it, it felt like that was, it was going to just be a kind of one dimensional path to making the same type of movies and the same type of things that everyone at film school was making. So I elected instead to do a, a BA at the University of Melbourne in philosophy. And that was probably the best thing I could have done because it very much it expanded my horizons, expanded my perspective. It gave me a whole different idea of the world and my place in it, and also gave me tools that I, I use to this day of like analyzing situations, analyzing thoughts and perspectives and, and recognizing how people are different. Um, but then I, after school, I basically kept making films and animations, and then that led to um bigger and bigger and bigger things i know that uh it's more common to kind of work your way up through you know starting from a from a runner all the way you know to directing i guess that's that was something you know as like the golden age of hollywood but i think far more common now is to be a one person crew with a camera even being the actor as well <laughs> and editing it yourself and then as you find success those movies get bigger and bigger and bigger until you're making um you know 50 person feature films like I am um and you're just now in charge of all of it because if you know if you work your uh, if you if you've done it all you know how it should be done or how you want it done um but I really think too that uh film is is no longer just something that's in the cinema or on television. Like I think most of us now are on social media and almost every company, every person is using that medium to tell their own story. And that's how, you know, you know, I think uh, rather than have your CV it's, um, uh, or your resume, it's like your prospective employers will look at your social media and to try and find out what who you are, what your story is, um, what your connection is, and and who what your personality is, and I think that most people are not as conscious as they could be of what their you know their environment tells uh, the story that it tells of them. So Dana, same question, but um, I also want to hear what you did to prepare yourself for your career. Um, so how, how you, when you realized um, you wanted to get into your field and discovered your, your passion for marketing and how you prepared yourself to get there. Thank you. If I forget one of those things, tell me, but I will. <laughs> I really want to, because, because, because I had a prior career um, and I left that career when I was older, I didn't know that I wanted to get in marketing, but I met a wonderful man who you know, that is my business partner, his name's Carlos. And, um, and we both clicked and we had both come from entertainment and he was in marketing and it was nine years ago. And I'll tell you at the beginning of opening my company, um, our company, I just wanted to figure out another way to make money. 
That's the truth. I didn't want to work for other, we, neither one of us wanted to work for people again, but it really was about how, how do I make some money, right? And we didn't know what was going to fly or what was going to work. Um, but what happened was, and the profound thing that changed my life and where I really found a passion for the kind of work we do is one of our um, early clients, we've been blessed to have the Los Angeles Public Library as one of our clients. We're in our sixth year with them now. And we were doing, they were having an immigration campaign. And so in marketing, what we do is we advertise on social media, on Google search, we have billboards and buses and rail and everything around the city of Los Angeles for those that I'm sure many are from Los Angeles. Um, so you see our ads everywhere. And this immigration campaign was to help people get citizenship free through the Los Angeles Public Library. So we had spent a lot of money and a lot of time for about a year um, advertising this, and it was really successful. And the Los Angeles Public Library invited Carlos and I to go to the, the uh, uh, oath-taking ceremony for the people, the children that were going to become citizens. And so we went down there, we went to the, the, to the library, Central Library, and we're standing there and we're watching in this auditorium and all these kids are there and they're with their parents and they're raving, they're waving flags and they're coming up on stage. And, you know, it, it was such a diverse audience. And Carlos and I looked at each other and we got tears in our eyes because it was like, we knew that we did something that made a difference to allow these kids to now become citizens of the United States. You know, and that at that moment, we're like multicultural advertising, diversity advertising and marketing, connecting with different groups, diverse groups, um, wherever we can is what it's all about for us. So that's really kind of the thing that made me realize it was more than just money. Money's awesome. We've done very well. We're very blessed. Um, but the, the thing that I see when lives are changed it's it's everything. So and the trajectory to get here, um, I will say the one thing I will say, um, I think it's important to say this, um, is that I did not go to college when I graduated high school. I went straight into the entertainment industry. It's all I wanted to do. I had people in the entertainment industry and I was invited in. I had a wonderful 30 year career in that in post-production. Um, but when I went to open my own business, I will tell you, I missed the fact that I missed the boat about college because I, I have worked my rear end off to catch up to things that college students would already know. And I have taken more classes, got more certifications of things that I might have been able to do back then, like get an MBA or something. So boy, I will say, if you're in college, like most of you are, stay in college because, uh, because it will certainly help if you're an entrepreneur. Okay. And then um, just kind of glancing at some of the the questions we have in the chat and in the Q&A, but also just kind of contextualizing them to everything. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur is hard. You guys know that more than anyone. Um, there was probably a period of time when, when you weren't getting paid right away. So um, I guess what's your advice for future entrepreneurs to kind of get through that rough patch, <laughs> if you will? Dana, I'll start with you. Sure, boy. Um, always got to chase the money. Never allow anybody to be late on the money. That is my number one rule because what I notice is once you start to allow people not to pay you for the value that you are and the value that you have given, it becomes a thing. So I'm always, we're all right on it about money. But <clears throat> I will say that that things that I never thought um, were as necessary as they are um, are contracts, getting contracts signed, getting contracts that are legal and that are um, binding and making sure, you know, there are many, many people I know have made a deal on a handshake, you know, and, um, and sometimes that works and it's awesome. And then sometimes it breaks up friendships, long-term friendships, because um, it is business. Ultimately it's business. So that, that's how, how, that's how we work. When I don't want to take the time, still take the time to make sure that we're, 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 we're partnered together correctly. And Oscar, um, it sounded like you also had a time between, you know, um, Missouri and million dollar listing. It, it takes time to get your license and all that. So um, how are you, how are you getting by? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely was a, was a rough patch. I think that for me, one of the biggest hurdles and everything that I faced was a, was a transition because, um, as a new agent, what they don't tell you is that that first year to two years, um, it takes time to build up your business, your clientele. And with real estate and with like anything, it's a compound effect. So the more clients you get, the, the more the business starts to roll in. But what they don't tell you is that 
your first three, six months to a year, you're not making anything unless you're really getting after it and you have that, that network already. So you either need um, some savings or another job. So that was the hardest thing for me was, you know, those first year and a half, two years was juggling both jobs and trying to transition away from, okay, I have my, my bills here that I need to, to uh, keep on working and keep on paying while I'm trying to build up this new business and just transition away. For me, that, that was one of the, the, the hardest things. I mean, the music business is music business. You kind of get paid based off of, you know, um, tours and this, that, and other, because I wasn't like an artist. I'm more on the business side of things, you know, but it, it was tough, but if you stick to it, you can definitely get through it and don't let anybody tell you that you can't, you know, just build that, build that network. And I always say that you are, you are the sum or you're the average of the three people you hang around with the most. So I would try to, to network with people who are smart. I mean, never be the smartest person in the room unless you're in the wrong room. And Rubidium, same question for you, um, but I also want to pair it with another question from, from Catherine of um, what was your elevator pitch? And so basically, how did you get your start before you actually started making these feature films and along with the your elevator pitch and really finding your audience? Well, it's interesting. I mean, in the, the money side of filmmaking is, are you doing something that other people value, right? Um, from the very first, you know, from way back when, you know, like I'm talking mid nineties, I was making little animations and little like basically animated GIFs for like websites. And if I had been trying to just do it in a vacuum and just say, oh, I want to make these, this is what I want to do. Um, then, you know, I probably would have, that been, <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't, wouldn't have gone anyway. But when I realized that, oh, other people need these and people, uh, they don't know how to do it themselves. So I have, there's a market for me there where I can um, get better at my own craft and provide something for people that's worth something. Uh, then it, it really, uh, you can really progress in that way. And I always made sure that when I was, um, like if I was shooting a commercial on, say uh, Monday, I would make sure that I could pick the camera up on Friday, shoot something of my own over the weekend and have all the gear and lights basically that was meant to just be, you know, sitting around at the rental house. I would shoot something of my own over the weekend and then show up to set on Monday tired, but ready to shoot for what I was gonna do. So, I mean, I think that you need to um, always look for a way that, uh, if you are working for like unapologetically say, look, I need, I need to provide value to people. I need to earn money. But then also if you're in a creative business and you're a creative entrepreneur, work out how that can also serve your show reel or what you want to do and the stories that you want to tell. As far as pitching goes, um, I always try and connect back to the reason that I want to make the film, the thing that originally gripped me and fascinated me and like why I wrote the script. I always try to, Try and get the um, the the real core of of what what captivated me, and I will often hitch the film for years before I've even wrote it or made it. And I get very good at working out what people are fascinated in about the idea that I have. And only if I can connect to other people and they're interested in, in it as well, do I then go ahead and make the film. Like I've definitely had films that I've been compelled to make, and then I've talked about to people that I trust or strangers about them on planes. And you just get that like dead look like, oh, okay. And then I realize I'm not pitching this right or there's no demand for this. Um, and it's uh, the people that go ahead and make whatever they want, irrespective of whether there's a, not, there's a market for it are the ones that don't usually get the chance to make another film. Um, so, I mean, those two things do go together. Right? You, you're not, uh, you wanna ideally make the film that you wanna make and you make it for yourself that in order to make that happen you need to you're constantly selling you're selling it to um 
financiers, you're selling it to the other members of your team, like your cinematographer and your actors, then you're selling it to the marketers and the distributors. So uh, you sales, as far as films goes, works best when you enjoy telling the story because you are still interested in, in what it is it represents, the greater meaning of it, how it connects to our lives, how it connects to our future. Um, and they're all things that, you know, they're, they're still uh, the reasons that make movies. Allie, may I jump in real quick about the elevator pitch? Yeah, uh, please do. Because I, I get, I, I do have a lot of um, business groups um, that I'm involved in. We work on things like this because it is, if you're riding in the elevator and you got 30 seconds, what are you going to say? But I think, first of all, what I learned is that that it, it can't just be the canned pitch because you got to know who you're talking to. If it's, you know, X or somebody in a completely different industry, you got to know who you're talking to. But, you know, one of the things that we say is, is, is we connect millions of diverse consumers to products and services that change their lives, right? And so what does that really mean? We don't know, but we want to get them to thinking and asking more questions and connecting. So elevator pitch formulas are super easy to Google, right, and find. And then you start to develop yourself and get comfortable with who and what you are and then tailor it to whoever you might see. That's how we do it. That's great advice. Um, okay, I'm writing it down after I ask the next question. Next <laughs> question. Um, so, okay, for and, and this is I'm going to go back to Dana because I think you kind of started um, answering this question a little bit earlier. But in terms of um, mentors and networking, how did that play into getting to where you are today? We literally, Wicked Bionic would not be where we were if we were not. Um, masters at showing up, literally showing up for networking. I don't, you know, now I've gotten a particular about where I go, but supporting others in business, partnering with other people and having people refer us and us referring has strictly come out of relationships that we have. We go to conferences, we go to like, I'm down in San Diego right now at a, a business, one of my business uh, uh, group, uh, mentorship group that, that I belong to, that I've been with for five years because they help us better understand and help me better understand my business and be able to grow and move ahead. Move ahead. And I think, um, you know, for mentors, my whole life, I was so fortunate. And, and I, I look back before we did this today, I was thinking like, why, why did I move ahead? I never had a career where I leapt to the top, but I one rung up the ladder at a time. Sometimes I wish I was leaping, but one rung up the ladder at a time, you know? And what it was, was it was, a, it was steady, but I think it was, I, oh, especially when I was younger and I was, uh, you know, in my early twenties, it was all about how could I please my bosses? How could I make my bosses look good? How I never had a chip on my shoulder. I would have done anything anybody asked and also to anticipate what they might need. And I was doing the same thing uh, that Oscar was saying. I was getting coffee. I was picking up film down in death at, at the airport. You know, I was doing anything they wanted. And I got recognized just because I kept them first in mind. How could I make their job and their life easier? And that that's really what, I mean, that that is it. It's gotta be a giving nature when you're young and you get recognized nice. And that's truly how I moved up. Not because I raised my hand and say, I want to move up. So hope that helps. Absolutely. In my W2 trajectory, how to make your uh, boss's job easier is definitely a plus. Um, so I'm going to move over to Rubidium as well with the same question of mentors and networking in your industry. Uh, I had a, uh, I was very blessed to have a mentor, uh, a painter, actually, a, a, a French painter called Andre Solier when I was 15 or 16, I found a book of his and we fell in love with the way that he painted. And I found that he lived like an hour from me and I would take the train and take painting lessons with him. And he was just uh, wonderfully inspiring and like really taught me so much about art. I think the biggest thing he did for me was he lived a life that was <clears throat> uh, an incredible example of he put his art first, but he also had a wonderful family. He he was an illustrator on the side, but like his art was important to him. And as a 15, 16 year old, I saw that I was like, this, it's not just, you know, the corporate world or like, you know, working on a building site. There is, there are, there are, it is possible to live this life where you make art that you care about and live in a community of, of like-minded people um, and, uh, you know, I ended up making a move, but one of my first documentary films about him and about his work called Portraits of Silence. And um, it really, it, it really was a uh, incredible process for me to go through, right? I mean, I'm a, 
introvert. I don't, uh, I don't drink. I don't like loud noises. I don't like really like public places. I don't think I've been to a bar or a nightclub in the last 20 years. And networking events aren't for me at all, right? That's not, I'm never gonna be in a, in a hotel lobby with a cocktail being like, pleased to meet you. That's, just, that's not who I am. Um, I instead discovered uh, that if I had a problem, I could eventually find a solution and then share that solution on social media. Um, for me, for filmmaking, it was YouTube. So I did like, I had, there was a new camera, I, it couldn't get it the way that I wanted it, then I would, I would say, oh, hey, everyone, I have this problem. This is, this is how I solved it. And that ended up being huge for me because, you know, four or five years later, I have like 70,000 YouTube subscribers and I get, I get job offers every, <laughs> every single day. <laughs> you know, like I have like, um, you know, mainly companies from China or, or India emailing me be like, will you make us this? Will you make us this? Can you feature, feature us? Will you review our stuff on your YouTube channel? I mean, when I was first out of that, I took it all and I ended up filling up my whole garage with like film gear, which was my dream at the time. But now I've got nowhere to put it all. Um, but I mean, there's the point I wanted to make was that even if you are not that stereotypical um, networker, find something that works for you and sharing the solutions that you've found to your problems with others, whether it's however you're doing that is going to create connections and, and become very, very, you know, show that you're, you know, a solution driven person and, and that you're someone that's valuable to know. And Oscar, same question for you. Um, also answering um, if your mentors and, and network because what you do is a little unique, right? Um, when you network, it's not just people in your industry, but your mentors, um, maybe they are specifically in your industry or related. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, mentorship and, and networking is very huge in my business. And I constantly try to do it every single day, even though it's very, very hard. I'm kind of a extrovert with introvert tendencies. I love to be at home <laughs> a lot, but top of last year, I told my wife, I said, look, I'm going to really try to get out and really network because if, if I can do that, it exposes me to a whole new pool of people, of clientele, of friends, of mentors, you know, coaches and everything, you know, starting off in, in this business, I needed a mentor. Not that well, I, I wanted and I needed one because they always say when you first start, you know, join a team, you know, always start from success up. A lot of people always want to reinvent the wheel. They want to research everything, research, research, and then they just get stuck researching for months and months and months and never actually take action. So it's it's better for you to go and find someone who's already done it, who can actually walk you through it so you're not stumbling or, or making mistakes or, you know, because you have to think about it. in my business you're dealing with someone's um their their biggest asset of, of their life you know when it comes to a house so a lot of times when you meet people you have about five to ten minutes to convince them of why you're the one to help them sell or buy this property you know so you have to give up the, the good vibes and everything really know what you're doing and that's where a mentor and a coach comes in place because you know he guides you through those pitfalls and that way you're able to to speak to them confidently and they're they're like okay yeah you know i want to buy this five million dollar house you're my agent this down the other and then you're like oh great but if you don't know what you're talking about they're going to sense it within the first five ten seconds like ah he's new <laughs> he doesn't know i don't trust him you know so but like networking for me I've, I've always tried to just really surround myself with those people who can really help me get to the next le level, because if not, then I'm just kind of stuck going in a circle, you know, or or on on a mouse wheel, you know. So, but I would never say. So mentors and coaches don't ever like to be asked to be a mentor. That's what I learned. You know, if they want to be your, your mentor, they're going to see the, the hustling grind in you, and they're going to actually offer up to be your coach or or your mentor because mentors they get asked to be mentors and coaches every single day. And first answer is no, no, go do any own, no. But if they see you hustling and grinding and see the, the, the passion that you really want to do this, they're going to 
offer of like, look, I want to help you out because I see that you're doing great things and you have a bright future. So they're going to go out, out of their way, take their time because what mentors and coaches is their time is the most valuable asset. So they don't want to waste on just anybody. But if they see it in you, then they're going to help you out. So mentors and coaches are definitely like something that I would recommend everybody get in any field. Absolutely. And they're out there. You just have to find the right people. And our chat is going off. So as Nasario said, find somebody smarter than you. <laughs> Ask them lots of questions. Absolutely. Um, so, okay, next question. And Oscar, I'm going to start this, this round with you. Um, what, it, what is some advice you wish you knew when you were first starting off in your field? In my field or as an entrepreneur? As an entrepreneur, your field, you're an entrepreneur. That's your field. <laughs> okay. oh, wow. So I always like to start off with things that they don't teach you in school. Credits is one of them. And especially in my business, credit is huge when you're trying to buy a house. You know, so learning financial literacy, learn how to work with money, cash, credit, balance those both out, building your, your credit, knowing how to pull out credit cards, knowing, you know, just doing those little things that you aren't taught in school. I feel like that is one of the biggest things for me. And like, I always think back and say, I wish that I started earlier because I started in this business at the age of 28. If I started at, you know, 18, 19, 20, because there's some of my peers who actually got their, their license at like 18. By the time they're 24, you know, they're, 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 they're pretty much set. If, if they've actually been working, they're set. You know, so I always wish that I started earlier. So my advice to anybody trying to be a, an entrepreneur is get started early, you know, start, start with action, you know, listen to podcasts, read books, you know, go into uh, the chat room. There's a lot of chat rooms on uh, Facebook that, that you can ask people for, for answers, things that you can't find on Google or, or, or YouTube or whatever it may be, you know, but do the research, take the time, do the research and take steps into getting to where you want to go. Don't stop. Don't, don't get stuck in that paralysis analysis where you're sitting there like, um, what do I want to do? And then you're just scared to like take the next step because you have all these thousand questions. Just take that step and just, just get after it. So that is my advice. Awesome. I'm going to jump over to Dana for the same question. Sure. Uh, gosh, there's so many things. How about go to college and get a business degree? <laughs> that would be really smart. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you, it, uh, on a personal level, I, I think I would go back and I would say, you know, don't be so afraid. Don't be so afraid. You know, I got so, I spent so long and I was behind the scenes in television because I couldn't imagine even being out. The fact that I'm out in front of a company and then I'm going to business things, you know, and selling, you know, our business and, and meeting people is shocking to me. I was so afraid. Like, did I know? Could I be? Was I okay? You know, and it kind of, um, it really started to work when other people started to, um, I spoke that I was afraid or didn't know how to do something like it's been mentioned, you know, look at their resources that you can't, that you can find and people always help. But when they start, I started to hear that, like I had it or I was okay, or it was, it was all right to go be bold right? Or to have, um, have, uh, have, uh, uh, have ambitions. Cause I've always been ambitious whether I was working for somebody else or myself, but that it was okay to have those ambitions. And as a female, it was okay. It was okay to be out there and to be equal and, and, and perceive myself as somebody that was equal. So there's so many things around that, that I think are more the softer things that I've learned, um, about myself and about, um, I wish I didn't hadn't hadn't learned some of these things so darn late. That is for sure. And and I think the thing about failure, I was seeing some of the things in the chat is, you know, I this is what I got, and I think it's true. I may fail, but I'm always moving forward with far more experience. So, you know, right? Don't let it get you down. Absolutely. And thanks for picking up that question. It was great. I saw it too. Rubidium, um, same question about um what advice you wish you'd had at the, the beginning of, of your career? And, and if you want to pair it with uh, Dana's last answer to um, the moment when you felt like giving up, but kept going. Uh, hmm. The th couple of things I learned that I wish I'd known when I started 
is that a yes can be worse than a no. Um, especially in Hollywood, what people will say is, we love your idea, you know, let's make this, let's move forward. And you're like, okay. And then you can wait and wait and wait and wait. It's uh, often, you know, like try waiting for other people to do what they said they would do for you um, can can take years, can can rob you of, of all these opportunities to do your own thing. So um, I think, you know, go forward with um, good intentions, but never let, uh, especially especially as an entrepreneur, but as a as in any field, um, never let never never let so, give over the, the the impetus, the locus of control to somebody else. You should if you're if you've you know sold a screenplay and you're waiting for them to green light it be still making your own stuff, right? Like don't, don't um, take your foot off the gas because someone tells you, you got this is going to be huge. I mean, I bet um, Oscar knows all about people who are like, oh yeah, this deal is going through. It's totally going to happen. And you, you can sit there for, for six months while they, and at the end they're like, it didn't happen. And you're like, and you felt terrible, but really it was you that, that stopped, stopped, stopped pushing and, and, and gave over your control to somebody else. Um, so that's a big one. And the other one that I wish I thought I'd known is I would look at people when I had graduated college, I look, I would look at people that in the position that I'm in now that have all the, the resources that need to shoot whatever they want, but didn't realize that they were limited by their responsibility, their success, that 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 they've created this community and this market and this expectation of doing the thing that they've already done, but bigger and better. And I wish I'd known that, you know, when I was 21, leaving college, you're so free. You have no expectations. No one has any expectations of you. You can go into the areas that will be the next huge, big things. I mean, um, like uh, if I was a filmmaker, if I graduated film school or if I wanted to be a filmmaker today and I was 18 or 21, I would get into, into VR, into 360 into drone cinematography, into, you know, like all of these things that are gonna be the next thing. I, I'm not gonna give up my <laughs> 25 years of experience to go into that in any real way because I'm already on this path. Whereas I, I know that, you know, people, the cinema, you know, we found out during COVID that theaters and cinemas are all but dead really. And that, that um, you know, like, yeah, and even, even Netflix and streaming that's replacing them is, is all up for grabs. So I think that you don't appreciate when you're just starting out how much uh, the world really is your oyster and that you're, you're free to take the chances that, that people like me can't anymore because you know, we have a business that we've been running and, and all the, the people that, are, that depend on us, um, mm -hmm. you're just so, so free to do, um, to, to follow your inspiration and follow where the, where the world is going. And no one knows it better than young people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been such a fantastic panel. You guys are amazing. I could keep talking to you for another hour. Thank you to our panelists and thank you so much to the students for participating. Si se puede, you guys can do this.